everybody. This is Dr. Brett Talley Daniel, MD, and I'm a neurologist and headache doctor. Today I'll be talking about cluster headache, clinical description, and treatment. Well, cluster headache is the most severe headache known to man. It is called suicide headaches for good reason. It's interesting that when the first American classification of headache was released in the JAMA in 1962, it had migraine as the main classification of headache, and underneath the name migraine were listed different types of migraine, such as common migraine, classical migraine, hemiplegic migraine, and at the bottom, cluster headache. That is, cluster headache was originally listed as a type of migraine, but that was long ago, and now the International Classification of Headache Disorders, first published in 1988, and now called ICHD3, classifies cluster headache separately from migraine and termed a trigeminal autonomic cephalgia. So, cluster headache, clinical description and treatment. Here's the definition from the Bible of Headache for the World, the International Classification of Headache Disorders, Volume 3. Cluster headache is A, at least five attacks, fulfilling B and D below, B, severe unilateral, orbital, supraorbital, and or temporal pain lasting 15 to 180 minutes. C, attacks is associated with at least one of the following signs on the side of pain. One, conjunctival injection. Two, lacrimation. Three, nasal congestion. Four, rhinorrhea. Five, forehead and facial sweating. Six, meiosis. Seven, ptosis. Eight, eyelid edema. And D is frequency from one every other day to eight per day. The clinical features. During the cluster headache, in addition to pain, the patient may experience symptoms on one side of the face, around the eye, upper cheek, or temple. These symptoms may be, and I'm going to redefine these, drooping of the upper lid, known as ptosis, smallness of one pupil, meiosis, sweating above the eye, Redness of the eye, conjunctival injection, tearing of one eye called lacrimation, nasal congestion or drainage of clear fluid called rhinorrhea. Because of these sinus type symptoms, the patient may present to the general doctor or ear, nose, throat surgeon with a self made wrong diagnosis of sinus headache. Related questions 1. What is the pain of cluster headache like? The pain begins quickly, without warning. It is excruciating in intensity and explosive in quality. Rarely the pain is pulsatile. Patients describe their headaches as quote-unquote killer headaches or quote-unquote suicide headache. The patient may be boring, stabbing, burning, like a knife, like a hot poker in the eye, and sometimes pulsating, throbbing, squeezing, or aching. At the end of the attack, the symptoms resolve in one to two minutes. Number two, where does cluster headache pain hurt? The pain of cluster headache is located in one temple, behind and above one eye. Sometimes the face, neck, ear on one side of the head may be involved. Cluster headache pain is persistently one-sided in location. Migraine without our headaches are one-sided 60 to 70% of the time. But cluster headaches are usually one-sided. Migraine may switch sides between back and forth, between one side and the other. The usual patient will say that one side is more prominent, but cluster headaches is usually strictly one-sided and switches sides in 15% of patients during the duration of a bout. Very rarely the patient will switch sides during the cluster period. Number three, what are the other symptoms found with cluster headache? The patient may have characteristic autonomic Anomic symptoms during the attack. Lacrimation from the eye affected with the pain is the most common associated symptom. The autonomic nervous system is a wired nervous system connecting the brain through the spinal cord and ganglia to the target organ. For instance, with tearing, the autonomic nervous system connects to the lacrimal gland to produce tears in the eye. The autonomic nervous system fibers enter the eye, wrapped around the carotid artery, and go to specific anatomic areas. 
these autonomic fibers innervate the pupil, causing dilatation or constriction. The nasal turbinates to produce mucus and a small muscle in the upper eyelid, which helps hold the eyelid up. Autonomic fibers also innervate the sweat glands over the forehead and the blood vessels, which course over the surface of the conjunctiva, which is the white part of the eye. All of the autonomic symptoms of cluster headache reflect temporarily altered dysfunction of autonomic fibers. Not every cluster headache patient has all the symptoms on the list, but commonly they may have three or four of the cardinal symptoms. Usually family members will comment about the upper eyelid drooping, which is a medical condition called ptosis. A small pupil on one side may be noted by a family member or the patient, but only if they're very observant. Redness of the conjunctiva, which is the white part of the eye, may be noted by the patient if they look at themselves closely in the mirror. Tearing, called lacrimation or nasal dripping and congestion, are usually pretty obvious. In my experience, forehead sweating is not a prominent symptom and may not be noted by the patient. Sometimes a patient who's had cluster headache for years may develop a permanent upper lid pupillary syndrome related to damage of the tiny autonomic fibers in the carotid artery on that side called Horner's syndrome. Patient with Horner's syndrome present with mild upper lid drooping so that the lid may fall down below the colored part of the eye. This is usually not bad enough to obscure vision and may just be a few millimeters of drooping. Also, Horner's syndrome is associated with smallness of the pupil on one side, a condition called meiosis. There may also be lack of sweating called anhydrosis over the upper forehead, and so many medical students memorize the classical physical findings of Horner's syndrome, ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. Nausea, vomiting, and sensitivity to light and sound may occur with cluster headache, but these symptoms are not as prominent as they are in migraine without aura. Number four, what are the onset and duration of attacks of cluster light? Cluster headaches come on without warning and reach a peak within 2 to 15 minutes. This is different from a typical migraine with aura attack, which may take half an hour to several hours between onset and peak of headache pain. Cluster headaches are very severe, quick-onset, one-sided headaches, which consist of pain around the eye, temple, or cheek. Cluster headaches may also track the clock, coming at the same time every day. This is called a circadian period periodicity, and it's a key feature of cluster headaches. The attacks of pain recur at the same hour each day for the duration of the cluster bout. The attacks characteristically occur one to two hours after going to sleep in half of patients. An attack at this time corresponds with dreaming and REM stage sleep, rapid eye movement stage sleep. Some patients have several attacks at night consistently interrupting sleep. Some patients get daytime attacks associated with napping or relaxation. 75% of attacks occur between 9 p.m. and 10 a.m. The duration of the attacks varies and ranges from 15 to 180 minutes with most cases lasting about 30 minutes to two hours with a mean of 45 minutes. The attacks may occur one to eight times a day and the patient is pain-free between the attacks. Number five, what does cluster mean in relation to these attacks? The headaches come in time periods called clusters, which usually last six to 12 weeks. The term cluster here means that the headaches cluster together in time is like grapes cluster together on the vine. Thus, the patient may state that he had six weeks of headaches in March and April of 2018, but then the headaches completely stopped. Following this, there were no headaches at all in 2019, but they started again in March of 2020 and brought the patient to see the doctor. Although the usual, usual cluster period is one and a half to three months, 10% of patients developed chronic cluster type headaches all year round. In these patients, the term cluster is really meaningless. All cluster, also cluster headaches patients may cycle between intermittent or the typical cluster pattern and chronic daily cluster headaches. Cl chronic cluster patients may spontaneously evolve into the episodic form without treatment. Although some cluster periods occur in the spring and fall, other researchers have found cluster cycles in February and June that seem to occur at the time of increase in daylight hours. Cluster attacks occur 7 to 10 days before the longest 
and shortest days in the year, suggesting that the pineal gland located in the center of the brain may be involved. The pineal gland responds to Responds to, responds to ambient light and helps set the sleep cycle. Number six, what's the behavior of a patient during an attack? The patient usually gets up and paces around the room. Sometimes they may sip if they don't lie down in bed in a quiet room with lights out like a typical migraine patient would do. And they don't miss work like a migraine patient would. Blau, in 1993, wrote an article in The Lancet on the behavior during a cluster headache, Dr. Blau stated, walking with the trunk slightly bent forwards and clutching the head or sitting and rocking backwards and forwards with the hands pressed on or near the painful site was the most common behavior during attacks. Self-trauma, a common feature, included pressing a finger, thumb, or fist into the affected eye or adjacent temple, hitting the forehead against a hard object like a wall, floor, radiator, or mantelpiece, or rubbing or pressing the forehead on the affected side on the carpet or chair. Others repeatedly hit or partially scratched the head distant from the painful side. One rubbed his thighs until they became very red and sore. Clenching fists so that the fingernails dug into the palms, applying intense heat, like a boiling cup of tea or hot water bottle, or ice-cold objects to the forehead were also described. In two patients with lower half cluster headaches, pain radiating to the upper jaw instead of upwards over the head, one inserted and twisted a steel knife blade between the painful upper teeth, while another pushed a fingernail as hard as he could into a tooth socket in the painful region. Three pushed a cotton wool tip up the affected nostril, while another blew his nose very hard, each to provoke the rhinorrhea that heralded the end of that attack. Dr. Carl Ekbaum noted the inability of cluster headache patients to remain still during attacks, in contrast with migraine patients who want to lie completely still. Number seven, what aggravates the cluster attacks? Another interesting feature is that cluster headaches may be aggravated by alcohol consumption only during the cluster period in about half the patients. If a migraine patient reacts to a certain alcoholic drink, the migraine may come on any time the patient imbibes that type of alcohol. The cluster headache patient may say that a beer or a glass of wine immediately set off a headache during the 6 to 12 weeks when the headaches come, but alcohol has no effect on inducing headache between the cluster attacks. The vasodilator nitroglycerin, known to treat vasospastic angina pectoris, characteristic of coronary artery disease, given as one milligram sublingually, triggers an attack during a bout. Histamine may also provoke an attack. Number eight, what are patients with cluster headache like? The patients often have a driven type A workaholic nature they tend to be ambitious, efficient, conscientious, conscientious, striving, compulsive, self-controlled, self-sufficient, reserved, and tense. They also tend to smoke cigarettes and drink alcohol more than the usual person. I recall a patient I saw years ago who had cluster headache and the typical driven lifestyle some of these patients have. In a small town, he was the sheriff, volunteer fireman, and emergency ambulance attendant. He did these jobs on the side while running his family business during the day. He carried four beepers. In the June 1985 Second International Headache Congress in Copenhagen, Dr. John Graham of the Headache Research Foundation in Massachusetts stated that, quote, most patients with cluster headache are men who are considered macho. Dr. Graham thought that the few women who got cluster headache tended to have square, boyish faces and to be masculine in appearance. At the same meeting, Dr. Lee Kudrow of the California Medical Clinic for a Headache in Encino, California, reported that men with cluster headaches were as much as three inches taller than the average and had characteristic facial features with deep, asymmetric facial Increases. There's an also a relationship between cluster headache and obstructive sleep apnea. 
Number eight, what is the nosology that is the branch of medicine dealing with the classification of disease of cluster headache? The title it says self, cluster headache causes confusion in the lay and sometimes doctors' minds. Several times a month, I'll talk with a headache patient who tell me their doctor said they had cluster headache because the patient had several weeks of daily headaches in a row. Usually the patient has migraine without R that's partially treated with acute therapy medication. The patient has one big, long headache with peaks and valleys lasting weeks or a month. Many of these patients have a diagnosis of medication abuse headache and have central sensitization. There was a lot of confusion in the literature when the syndrome of what we now is universally called cluster headache was first recognized. At the start of my career in the late 60s as a neurologist, I was taught to call this type of headache vasodilating headache, which I did for several years until the cluster term rose to prominence and then stuck. Other names offered for cluster headache have been migranous neuralgia, histamine headache, histamine cephalgia, Horton's headache, ciliary neuralgia, Sluter's sphenopalatine neuralgia, geniculate neuralgia, Rader's paratrigeminal neuralgia, erythroposybalgia, Rader's syndrome, Vidian neuralgia, red migraine because the white part of the eye turns red, periodic migranous neuralgia, ciliary migranous neuralgia, greater superficial petrosal neuralgia, neuralgia, and whew, anterior migraine. Cluster headache is now firmly established as a distinct syndrome. Finally, it was understood by people writing in neurology in the 70s that would, all these conditions had similar symptoms and that different doctors and different parts of the world have been describing it the same, the same thing. Number nine, what is the epidemiology of a cluster headache? Cluster headache occurs in approximately 69 cases per 100,000 people and is far less common than migraine. Men are affected more than women at a rate of 6 to 1. It usually occurs between the ages of 20 to 50 years with a mean of 30 years. However, it may begin as early as the first decade and as late as the eighth decade. Attacks in women with cluster headache usually do not correlate with their menses. They generally stop during pregnancy, but like migraine, may be started by the use of oral contraceptives. Women may have both cluster headache and migraine, but they're commonly misdiagnosed only with migraine. Number 10. Does cluster headache occur in women? Rosin, writing in the Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Psychiatry in 2001, studied the clinical features of cluster headache in women and found that their experience was similar to men. Women developed cluster headache earlier than men with the mean age of onset at 29 years in women as opposed to 31 years in men. Women had two peaks of onset in the second and fifth decade, whereas men peaked at 31 years. <clears throat> cluster headaches used to occur mainly in men, and a ratio of men to women of 6 to 1 was commonly quoted in the past, but recent articles suggest that women are getting the syndrome more often, perhaps related to the stress of women leaving the home and entering the workplace. Bara et al. wrote in Neurology in 2002 on cluster headache, a prospective clinical study with diagnostic implications. They stated that, quote, the overall male to female ratio in the sample they had was 2.5 to 1, which has decreased with time. Also, Maisoni wrote an article in 1997 in Headache entitled, Male Predominance of Cluster Headaches is Progressively Dec Decreasing Over the Years. Number 11, when does cluster headache start? The typical age is the third decade, which would be 20 through year, 30 years old, but the range extends from 20 to about 60 years. Many persons with cluster headache have family members with migraine. Number 12, what does the history of neurology say about cluster headache? The history of the various terms used to describe this painful disorder has a long serpentine story weaving back to the 18th century. Most authors give early credit to the description made by von Mollendorf, who in 1867 described, quote, red migraine with hemicrania, homolateral redness of face, injection of the eye, lacrimation, and dilatation of the temporal arteries, period, end quote. However, an early report was made by Gerhard von Sweeten, who gave a full description of episodic cluster headache, which fulfills international headache criteria in 1745 in his textbook on clinical medicine. 
He was the founder of the then leading medical center in the Vienna School. His article, Lost Because of Originally Written Latin, was found again and translated in 1992. Wilfred Harris, living from 1869 to 1960. In 1926, Wilfred Harris described a special recurrent headache which he called periodic migranous neuralgia. In 1936, in the British Medical Journal, Harris wrote about the subject again using the title of ciliary migranous neuralgia. Harris was the first to describe successful treatment of the acute attack of cluster headache with ergotamine. In his 1936 article, Harris offered his definition of migranous neuralgia, stating, quote, I've employed the term migranous neuralgia to describe cases of recurrent neuralgia affecting the temple on the side of the forehead and often both jaws, sometimes extending to the back of the head, usually strictly one-sided. The pain in these cases is often most intense and excruciating and may start suddenly or gradually and subside in the same way. The duration of the pain varying from 10 minutes to half an hour or often to five or six hours and occasionally for 24 hours for periods of six to eight weeks yearly. Nausea occasionally covers the pain, suggesting it's associated with migraine, but vomiting is rare, and visual spectra and transient hemonopia are never met with as is the usual form of migraine, end quote. Case 2 from Harris's 1936 article on ciliary migratus neuralgia follows. In one case, indeed, a man of 40 suffered almost continuously for three weeks, having had only eight hours sleep during that period. His first attack began when he was age 37, and the longest interval between attacks was two months. The severe pain lasting usually one or two weeks, being continuous and limited strictly to the left eyeball. Here is stated, the pain is described by various sufferers as intensely severe, very excruciating. The eye feels as though being hammered or rolled on the ground. The eye feels as if you're being pulled out or turned inside out like boiling water behind the eye. Baynard Horton, living from 1895 to 1980. Horton et al. spoke about a new syndrome, which they originally named erythromyalgia of the head in 1939, but changed to histamine cephalgia in 1941. Horton at the Mayo Clinic called the syndrome histamine headache in 1939. One of Horton's cases from his 1939 article follows. Vasodilating pain in the left eye, associated with a left hemicrania, and precipitated by the drinking of beer. A man, aged 58 years, gave a history of recurring bouts of pain in the left eye, of 12 months duration. The attacks occurred either during the day or night and often awakened him from a sound sleep. The onset of the pain was gradual. It was located behind the left eye. It was of a constant, sharp character, but no throbbing sensation was present. When the pain lasted more than one and a half hours, it extended to the left temporal and occipital regions and into the neck. It decreased in the orbital region as it increased in the occipital region. This pain often persisted for four or five hours without associated nausea or vomiting. The drinking of alcoholic beverages, particularly beer, invariably precipitated attack in the left eye after an interval of 30 to 50 minutes. The pain was reproduced on three occasions by having the patient drink a bottle of beer. Compression of the left common carotid artery gave momentary relief. Gardner et al. introduced Greater superficial petrosal neuralgia in 1947 and suggested treatment by resecting the nerve. Cluster headache was used by Kunkel in 1952 and then by Friedman and Michelopoulos in 1958. In 1956, Sir Charles Simmons, writing in the journal Brain, gave a complete account of the syndrome of cluster headache in an article entitled a particular variety of headache which helped to educate the general medical audience and the public about this little-known malady. Simmons stated about the syndrome, its essential features are the occurrence of paroxysm of headache, that is to say pain of sudden onset and transitory duration, which occur in bouts lasting as a rule for several weeks with long intervals of perfect freedom. 
In the paroxysm, the pain is felt mainly in the left supraorbital region or in and behind the eye, though it may spread beyond this region. It is, however, strictly unilateral. It is of agonizing severity, but very rarely lasts longer than two hours, and often less. During a bout, there's usually at least one paroxysm in each 24 hours. There may be more. In the intervals between paroxysms, there is complete relief. The bout having ended, there is no further complaint of headache until the occurrence of the next bout after an interval of freedom, which is rarely less than six months and maybe several years. No local cause for the pain is to be discovered in the shape of disease of the eyes, nose, uh, nasal sinuses, ear, scalp, or skull, or the sensory nerve supplying the region where the pain is felt. Sir Charles Simmons' report of case one as follows. A male aged 39 when first seen in 1948, at the age of 35, began to have attacks of pain behind the left eye, described as like pain in a tooth exposed to cold, reaching intensity in 15 minutes, remaining thus for an hour or an hour and a half, and rapidly disappearing, but sometimes followed by a dull ache for an hour or two. At the height of the attacks, the eye would water and become bloodshot, and the left side of the nose would feel blocked. The attack would usually begin between 2 in the morning and 3 in the morning, and that's a.m., and would be repeated for two or three nights in succession. After an interval of six or eight weeks, the experience would be repeated. When seen again in November 1955, he reported the nature of the attacks had remained unaltered, but that the series of bouts had gradually become longer, lasting up to a fortnight, and the intervals between bouts had also lengthened to six months. Then, in the summer of 1952, he had a bout lasting four weeks, followed by a complete freedom for 18 months. There was then a bout lasting two weeks, again followed by freedom for 18 months, when he began a bout which had lasted for five weeks when he was seen. And this paroxysm had occurred at irregular times, mainly during the night, but occasionally during the day. On two occasions, there had been three paroxysms in the 24 hours, but on several occasions, he'd gone 24 hours without a paroxysm. Number 13, what's the current understanding of uh, cluster headache? Cluster headache is now considered to be one of the trigeminal autonomic cephalgias, a group of primary headaches which include paroxysmal hemicrania and short-lasting unilateral neuralgiform headache, attacks of conjunctival injection and tearing. That's abbreviated as or it's listed as SUNCT, S-U-N-C-T. The area of the brain involved with cluster headache is the posterior hypothalamic, thalamic, hypothalamic gray matter. It is in contradiction to the area of the brain involved with migraine, it's located, which is located in the brain stem. Goadsby and Lipton stated in a review of the subject in Brain in 1999, the short-lasting primary headache syndromes may be conveniently divided into those exhibiting marked autonomic activation and those without autonomic activation. The former group comprises chronic and episodic paroxysmal hemicrania, short-lasting unilateral neurologiform headache with conjunctival injection and tearing, sunct syndrome, and cluster headache. These headache syndromes are compared with other short lasting headache disorders such as hypnic headache and persistent headache with milder autonomic features such as hemicrania contigua. Cluster headaches included with the shorter lasting headaches to attempt a nosological analysis of these syndromes. The paroxysmal hemicranias are characterized by frequent short lasting attacks of unilateral pain usually in the orbital, supraorbital, or temporal region that typically last minutes. The attack frequency should usually ranges from 5 to 40 attacks per day. The pain is severe and associated with autonomic symptoms such as conjunctival injection, lacrimation, nasal congestion, rhinorrhea, ptosis, or eyelid edema. Almost all reported cases respond to treatment with endomethacin, but respond poorly to other treatments, including other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. A recent case study demonstrates the release of both trigeminal and parasympathetic neuropeptides during a bout of pain in the same pattern previously described in cluster headache. Number four, what is the ICHD3 classification of cluster headache? So it says cluster headache and other trigeminal and autonomic cephalgia, cluster headache, episodic cluster headache, chronic cluster headache, paroxysmal hemicrania, episodic paroxysmal hemicrania, 
chronic paroxysmal hemicrania, short-lasting unilateral neuralgiform headache attacks with conjunctival injection and tearing, that's sunk, probable trigeminal autonomic cephalgia, probable cluster headache, probable paroxysmal hemicrania, and probable sunk. Number 15, Peter Goadsby, really a world expert on this, wrote in the Lancet Neurology in 2002 on pathophysiology of cluster headache, a trigeminal autonomic cephalgia, and he stated, quote, cluster headache is a form of primary neurovascular headache with the following features. Severe unilateral, commonly retroorbital pain accompanied by restlessness or agitation and cranial parasympathetic autonomic symptoms such as lacrimation and conjunctival injection. It occurs in attacks typically of less than three hours in length and in bouts or clusters of a few months during which the patient has one or two attacks per day. The individual attack involves activation of the trigeminal autonomic reflux. Thus, headaches can be broadly classified <coughs> excuse me, with the other trigeminal autonomic cephalgias, such as paroxysmal hemicrania and the syndrome of short-lasting unilateral neuralgiform headache attacks with conjunctival injection and tearing sunk. Observations of circadian biologic changes and the neuroendocrine disturbance have suggested a pivotal role for the hypothalamus in cluster headache. Functional neuroimaging with PET and anatomical imaging with voxel-based morphometry have identified the posterior hypothalamic gray matter as the key area for the basis, basic defect in cluster headache. Number 16, what is cluster tick syndrome? Well, there are also patients who have cluster headaches and trigeminal neuralgia called tick dolero. This, this group of patients may be called cluster tick syndrome. And the patient should receive both diagnoses and be treated for both conditions. Number 17, how medicine has changed? Horton at the Mayo Clinic at Well Experienced Cluster Headaches said, quote, error in diagnosis is usually due to the fact that physician, the physician has not had the opportunity to observe the patient in the course of a spontaneous or induced attack, end of quote. What Horton described is usually no longer possible since the doctor and the patient now only face the clinic in the doctor's office, usually between tags, and the patient describes a history of something that had happened in the past rather than the doctor seeing the patient at home in his native environment and observing an attack. Number 18, treatment of cluster headache, acute treatment. Steroids, hydrocortisone drugs are used. Prednisone, 20 milligrams given orally three times a day for 7 to 10 days will sometimes stop the attack. Oxygen. Nasal oxygen is effective for cluster headache patients and some migraine patients with clusters of short, quick headache. Oxygen is delivered from a canister through a plastic tubing through a non-breather face mask at a flow rate of 6 to 15 liters per minute. Oxygen therapy is safe, rapid, and usually effective treatment for cluster headache. Oxygen treatment may be effective in 10 minutes. Oxygen is not a drug, so there are no side effects from treatment. Triptans. General triptan rules. Don't use a, with a personal history or strong family history of coronary artery disease. Don't use with uncontrolled hypertension. Limit the dose in children, the elderly, defined here as over 65 years old, and patients with basilar artery or complicated migraine or symptoms over 40 minutes. Don't mix the triptans or take with ergotamine within 24 hours. Common triptan side effects are chest tightness or pressure, near fainting, neck and back pain, which may be burning, warm or hot, dizziness or drowsiness. Imatrix simitriptan is most effective when given via a gun-type injector. The medicine comes in a vial with a needle and is loaded into the injector like a bullet. The medicine then is injected subcutaneously by pushing a trigger. This is a very slick, high-tech system. The dose injection is either 6, 4, or 3 milligrams at the onset of the cluster. Injectable sumatriptan onset of treatment is 10 minutes and gives the highest dose to the brain of any of the triptan delivery systems. Sumavil Dose Pro is a pressure jet application of 6 milligrams of sumatriptan needle free through the skin. And Amitrex nasal spray is also available as 520 squirt per nostril per cluster, although that gives fast treatment as the low dose. Zomig or Zomatriptan. Uh, they should decrease the dose 50% if the patient is taking tagamet, which is simetidine, 
It comes as a 2.5 or 5 milligram nasal spray with onset of activity at 10 minutes. The dose of onset is 2.5 or 5 milligrams and may repeat in two hours. Dihydroagotamine, DHE, is indicated for acute therapy of both migraine and cluster headache. It's a vasoconstrictor with a long history of use of migraine. The dose is 3 milligrams subcutaneously, and that's listed in uh, my web page. Side effects are severe coronary basal spasm, myocardial infarction, cerebral ischemia, hypertension, stroke, side effect, commonly nausea and vomiting, leg and thigh cramps. All right. Development of medication overuse headache with cluster. While the medication overuse headache with triptan is taken and supertriptan more than 10 days a month can develop, it is rare with cluster headache patients, and generally patients should treat their severe, quick, repetitive suicide headaches with a triptan whenever the headaches come, which may be one to eight a day. However, having stated this, there are rare reports of medication overuse headaches with cluster treatment. Articles regarding rare development of medication overuse headache have been during treatment of cluster headache follow. Palomari et al. Uh, writing in Neurology in 2006 on medication abuse headache in patients with cluster headache. They uh, described uh, objective medication abuse headache in cluster headache patients is incompletely described, perhaps because of relatively low prevalence. And they conclude that medication abuse headache is previously unrecognized and treatable problem associated with cluster headache. Cluster headache patients should be carefully monitored, especially those with personal family history of migraine. And there's another report here uh, you can access on my blog uh, site at Sentinels, et cetera. Triptans aren't indicated by insurance for treatment of cluster headaches. Only their indication is migraine headache, which is a problem then getting the insurance to pay for triptans as they see sumatriptan or drugs like that is only indicated for acute therapy of migraine and won't give enough medicine for cluster. The patient should try an insurance override in that situation. Preventive treatment, Depakote, Divalprox, sodium, comes as a delayed release oral tablet in different uh, doses. People have used Depakote also. Um, Lithobid comes in oral capsule to be used. Verafamil ER can be used. And that's been the standard accepted best treatment of choice for prevention of cluster headaches. Recently, there's a new drug out, which is one of the CGRP drugs called Imgality. Uh, it's a new prescription drug used in adults for the prevention of treatment of migraine. Imgality, 120 milligrams, comes in a pre-filled syringe, and it's can be given subcutaneously once a month for migraine, but for treating cluster headache, there's a 300 milligram dose that comes in three of the 100 milligram pre-filled syringes, which are taken one after the other at the start of the cluster period, and then every month until the end of the cluster period. A warning and side effects of emigality. Don't use it if you're allergic or any other to any of the ingredients. Emigality may cause allergic reactions such as itching, rash, hives, and trouble breathing. Um, emigality is one of the four FDA-approved CGRP drugs for treating migraine. The only in that group indicated treating cluster headache. Emigality blocks the effect of CGRP, one of the neurotoxins released in the brain with migraine and cluster headache. These CGRP antibody drugs have no effect with any other known drug and can be used li liberally and safely with any other drug. For instance, penicillin has 10 or more drugs uh, that cannot be used for the patients on penicillin, but the CGRP drugs like Imgality can be used with any drug. Also, we have a new medical device, a new treatment device, acute therapy of migraine, or episodic treatment of cluster headache is the gamma core device, which is a vagal nerve stimulator externally applied to the neck. What are the side effects of using GammaCore? GammaCore treated patients did not have any serious treatment related side effects. Most reported side effects were mild, only occurring during the use of the device, and then went away after each treatment. The most common side effects were discomfort and redness at the application site, dizziness, and a tingling feeling where the device was applied to the neck. How does GammaCore work? Well, it's a vagal nerve stimulator. The vagus nerve is one of the largest nerve in the parasympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system, and gamma core activates, activates the vagus nerve by the mild electrical stimulation. And so this is the end of a pretty long discussion of the clinical uh, description of uh, cluster headache. I'll get into a lot of things like the nosology, the history of cluster headache, the naming of it, and also on treatment. So I would appreciate it if you would subscribe to my 
uh, my podcast so we can get in touch with each other and um, look for me on um, other podcasts on migraine in, in, that exist. God bless all you people that have cluster headaches, and I will see you again on another talk.